Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday morning, Erev Shabbat. I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom Mavorach. All the blessings, Be'ezat Hashem, should be showered upon us and our families. Amen. Rabotai, uh, we are studying this week a double header, Behar Behukotai. So let's open up. Right in the beginning of our Perasha, Behukotai, today we are studying the second Perasha. And the Perasha deals with a lot of the blessings that come to a person who observes the Torah and a lot of the curses that come to a person that does not observe the Torah. A lot of people are afraid to actually get the Aliyah that deals with the Kelalot. There's a lot of funny videos out there. I'm sure you could find them on YouTube or whatever platform. Uh, but the, you know, the Chafetz Chaim used to say, and, and many great rabbis, they used to say, the fool is not the person who, go, who gets the Aliyah. The fool is the person who is afraid to hear the Aliyah. Um, and they never learn the lessons of what the Torah wants and doesn't want. So, you know, instead of being so afraid of, oh, don't give me this Aliyah, I don't want to go up for it. Opposite. He says, go up, listen, and then you won't, and then you won't get the curses because you know exactly what to not do. Either way, Berashat <clears throat> Behukotai. Um, uh, begins with the very famous Paksuk. So let's open up right in the beginning of <clears throat> chapter 26. It's actually not the first Pasuk. The Parashah begins in Pasuk Gima. We know that the Pesukim were not invented by a religious source. So chapter and verse is not significant. Well, you know, they were actually made up by the Christians. Uh, our our the divisions are by Perasha and by Aliyot. We don't really know. We don't care so much about the chapter, but nothing wrong with using it. Either way, chapter 26, Pasuk 3. Im bechukotai telechu vet mitzvotai tishmeru va'asitem otam. So here we go. The Pasuk says right off the bat, If you follow my laws and faithfully observe my commandments. Okay. So if you follow my laws, Right, but again, the, the English is not always the best. So let's read the Hebrew and translate. Im bechukotai telechu. If we go in God's chukim, ve'et mitzvotai tishmoru, and we observe His mitzvot, va'asitem otam, and we do them. So there's three different things going on in this pasuk, and each one obviously is a different level than the next. So right away, Rashi comes along, and Rashi tells us. I'll tell you what each one means. And, um, and we actually work backwards over here. Et mitzvotai tishmeru. If you observe my mitzvot, Rashi says, Hevu amelim batorah al menat lishmor ul kayem. That we should study Torah in order to keep it. Right? There's no way you could keep Torah if you don't learn. Our rabbis tell us in Pekeh Avot, Lo am haaretz hasid. You'll never be a chasid if you're amaaretz. En bur yerechet. You cannot fear Hashem and fear sin if you're a boor, if you're an ignorant person. If you are boorish, literally in English, if you are uh, ignorant, if we don't study Torah, then how are we going to know? Am I allowed to do this? Is this food allowed to be eaten? Am I allowed to be with that person? Am I allowed to touch that thing? Am I allowed to do this on Shabbat? Am I allowed to say these words? Am I allowed to act like this in business? Is, am I entitled? Are they, right? All these things, we cannot make up halachot for ourselves. We have to uh, read what the Torah wants. And if we don't, we're going to stay. So therefore, the Pasuk says, Im, right? Im bechukotai telechu ve'et mitzvotai tishmeru. Okay, beautiful. So we, we are shomer. Mitzvot, says Rashi, that means learning Torah to know what to do. Okay, so if that's what that phrase means, what is the first phrase? Im behukotai telechu. Rashi says, could that mean to keep the mitzvot? Because literally that's what it means. If you go in my, if you follow my chuki, my laws. Rashi says it can't mean keeping the mitzvot. Because that's what we're going to say in the next phrase, which we just explained. Rather, it means to study Torah. Okay, what kind of study? Study why? Study to observe? Study to keep? No! No, says Rashi, no. That's what the second phrase means. The second half means that we're studying Torah in order to do. The first phrase 
is we are studying for no other reason than for its own sake. And that is called Torah Lishma. That's a very powerful concept. A lot of times the reason we learn is because, you know, we, we want to know what to do, which is great, which is excellent. And we, we learn because we feel like it's important to know how to act. And it gives me purpose and meaning and direction, etc. Yes. Part of the reason we learn is for the results. But the three words of our perasha, the name of our perasha, Bechu Kotai, Im Bechu Kotai Telechu, says Rashi, Shetihiyu Amelim Batorah, and it's not from him, he's obviously quoting the Midrash, our rabbis, that you shall study and toil and exert yourselves in Torah for no other reason, just to study Torah. And this is a concept that is very, very, very unique to Judaism. There is no inyan, there's no advantage to working hard in life for just working hard. I'll give you an example. Okay, I was moving last week, not a positive experience. And the, I, w- I was striking a conversation with the foreman, the head guy. And you know how much a mover makes? Take a guess. Anyone want to take a guess how much they make? I can't lip read, Joe. But if I think you're saying $15 an hour. That's what they make. If you said 15, five zero. Nope. One five. One five an hour. Fifteen dollars. You ready for this? To schlep and to carry for an hour boxes into the elevator, up the stairs, into the truck, and to do it again and again and again and again. Heavy furniture, couches, tables, bookcases, I mean heavy things for $15 an hour. Now, last night I went out with my wife and um, in the city it's hard to sometimes find babysitters, so we were we went with this option, um, $20 an hour. That's what it was. We had no other choice. We paid 20. I said to my wife on the way <laughs> into the cab, I'm like, you know, Frida, there's um, the, these movers are getting 15 an hour. This lady is sitting on our couch on her phone playing music, texting her friends, and she's making 20 an hour. In life, there's no advantage to working harder necessarily. If you could do less and make more, great, beautiful. Why not? Right? It's not, uh, that's the goal of life, by the way. To try to figure out how to make as much as you can with as little as you can. Little effort as possible. Judaism is unique in that it values effort and effort alone. Even if there's no results. Even if the result is maybe less. The fact that you worked harder is unique. You know, in high school or in elementary school, any school, They used to tell us, you know, the teacher would ask a question and you would raise your hand. Oh, I know, I know. And you would give her the answer, Abraham Lincoln, and you were wrong. Or you would do a book report and you tried very hard. And then the the project, so they would sometimes tell us, A for effort. You ever heard that? I always wondered why it wasn't an E for effort. That's usually, either way. Um, But A meaning A plus. That's the, the grade. You get an A, a grade A for effort. Okay, I understand. Um... But you know, usually what that meant is that you get an A for effort, but you're going to get a C because of overall the project wasn't impressive or whatever it is, right? In life, success is based on results, right? Are you successful? The successful restaurant is the one that stays open. The successful uh, husband is the one that is stays married. The successful businessman is the one that's making millions. The successful parent is the one that has a child that's valedictorian. The successful success success is based on results. The successful student is the one that has a hundred. The successful team is the one that has the most points. Results based. But what about effort? 
in this world that we live in, effort doesn't really matter. Right? A football team could try very hard. If the other team has more points and they're better, they win. doesn't matter how hard you... I don't care about your effort. You could be in sales and you tried very hard. And you don't make the sale. Don't matter to me. You didn't make the sale, you get nothing. If you didn't make the sale, then you don't get the money. Only thing that matters in this world is the results. You can tell the boss that I tried hard all day long. Please, I tried, I tried. Nobody cares, right? Judaism is unique in that we actually reward effort. Not only we're rewarded, it's actually the main component. Meaning, did you understand what I just said? If two people try to do something, one tries harder but doesn't get results, and the other tries less and gets better results, Judaism values more the effort. You know, there's a story in the Gemara about this rabbi. His name was Rav Yosef. Gemara, this is found in Masechet Pesachim, page 50a. 50a. Rav Yosef, he became ill and his soul left him. Okay, he, has, he had a, a, a past body experience. Well, when he regained consciousness, his father said to him, Beni, my son, what did you see? And Rav Yosef said back to his father, Olam hafuch ra'iti, the famous line. I saw an upside down world, dad. His father said, how do you mean? He said, I don't know, I'll tell you something, dad. I went up there in Olam Abba, and I saw that the people that down here are amazing and valued and are so, uh, you know, up there in society, in the next world, they're actually like the janitors, they're the garbage men, they're very, very low. And the people that down here are the garbage men, the people that down here we view with our eyes as very low, in the next world, wow, they are on top, they are king, they are living. And Rav Yosef's father said to him, my son, you didn't see an upside down world. You saw the real world. That's really how it is. This down here is upside down. And Rabbi Dessler explains something fascinating. That the lowly, when the Gemara says that this world, the low down here, were really big up there, it's referring to those people who toil and work very hard to understand the Torah. A person, and I read Rabbi Dessler, a person may work very hard at understanding the Torah, but because he has limited capabilities, he accomplishes very little. He never ends up writing a book. He never ends up being a posik. He never ends up coming out with any lectures. He tries all day long, but he wasn't gifted with the power to speak or the oratory skills or a pen or the, or the talent of writing or whatever it is. And he never ends up accomplishing. But his effort, very, he tries all day long trying to understand. That low person down here that nobody stands up for and nobody respects because they're not really a rabbi, that person in the next world is on top. And you could have other people that down here, everyone stands up for them. And they're very chashuv because they were gifted, but they don't really try so hard. Their gifts came to them easily. Their knowledge comes easily. And so in one hour, they can finish studying what would take someone else 10. Such a person who is down here, everyone says his hand, Rabbi, give me beracha, Mr. So-and-so, please. We want to honor you with a dinner, right? All these important people down here. If they didn't put the effort, now again, I'm not saying that it's exclusive. It doesn't mean that just because you're successful down here, you can't also be successful up there. It's not either or. There definitely will be overlap. The point is that just because down here a person seems to be on top, it doesn't necessarily indicate that that's how it's going to be in the next world. If they didn't try, if the effort is not there, then they get an F for effort. And the effort up there is really what matters most. And there is a, a fascinating Gemara. There is a fascinating Gemara in Masechet Shabbat. And we know this Gemara because we quote it often. It's a very 
um, humorous Gemara in ways, depending on the creativity of the rabbi saying it. But from the Gemara's Masechet Shabbat, let's open up page 31. Lamed Aleph. Okay. And the stories of a year, by the way, a lot of stories back to back of uh, different encounters that people had with the Rabbi Hillel. One of them, you probably heard, it's about the man who had a bet that he could get Hillel nervous and angry. And he comes to him on Friday afternoon and he asks him these three silly questions. Are we familiar with that one? Some of us are? Okay. Okay, we're not doing that one today. We spoke about it in the past. I want to move on to the next story. Because actually most of us are unaware that there are other stories about Hillel here. That's the most famous one, I think. But the Gemara continues. Ten Rabbanan. Once upon a time, a Goy, Nanju, came to Shammai. And he said to him, This is also a very famous one. He comes to Shammai and he says, Teach me the whole Torah and I'll convert if you do. But I want you to teach it to me on one leg. Well, Shammai, he kicked him out. Not, in, not interested in such a conversion. You're obviously insincere, etc., etc., etc. Well, Balif ne Hillel, Gayere, Hillel, he comes to Hillel and he, t- he converts him. And he says, all right, I'll teach it to you on one leg. And he tells him, a pasuk, okay. Shuv ma'ase be'goy echad, another story. Of a goy that came to the Bet Midrash. And he heard them learning when it came to the clothing of the Kohen Gadol. You ready for this one? This is actually less known than the other ones. So you ready? There was a goy walking by a shul and he overheard them saying how these are the clothing and such expensive and diamonds on his chest and this and that. And he asked them, who gets to wear these clothings that you guys are describing? They told him, Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So the goy said to himself, Ah, elech ve'et gayer bishvil she'yesimuni Kohen Gadol. I am going to convert so that I can become a Kohen Gadol. Now, obviously, is that legal? Could a Goy who converts become a Kohen Gadol? Obviously not allowed. Because, a stranger cannot approach. Either way, I'm going to convert and try to become a Kohen Gadol. Okay, a nice goal. Balifnei Shammai. He came to Shammai and he said to him, um, Please convert me so that I can become a Kohen Gadol. Again, He pushed him away with the Amat HaBinyan. It seems like Shammai always had this ruler ready with him. It seems like a lot of people came to convert in his day, always pushing people with this ruler. But uh, Hillel, he comes to Hillel and he says to him, Gayereni. Says Hillel, convert me to make me Kohen Gadol. Gayere, he converts him. Hillel is very um, easy going. He converts the guy. Amar lo, he says to the guy, Now, you want to be Kohen Gadol, that's fine, but you got to learn the law, laws. You can't make you a king if you don't know the laws of the land. Go and study. Halach vikara, he went out and he studied. He saw the Pasuk. And his pasuk says, "Ve'azara karev yumat, the stranger that approaches shall be put to death." And the convert was very nervous. Whoa! So he runs to Hillel. He says, "Rabbi, tell me, who is this stranger that he will die if he approaches the sanctuary?" Hillel says, "Even David, the king of Israel, cannot go in because he's not a kohen." So nasao togir kal v'hamer be'atzmo, the convert realized. Obviously, if David Amelech cannot become a Kohen Gadol, how am I supposed to become a um, Kohen Gadol? Okay, and the Gemara over here is always, you know, puzzling. What exactly were these Goyim thinking? 
What is the message of this Gemara? Is it just here to show off and, and show us how patient Hillel was? Maybe. Maybe it's, you know, praising Hillel and trying to tell us to be more like him and less like Shammai. I don't know. You know, but the stories themselves, you know, they're very specific. And there's a message, I believe, in the story itself. And the, the rabbis explain that these two goyim that came to convert, one of them wants to be converted on one leg, and one of them wants to be converted and become high priest. They come with secular outlooks because they're non-Jewish. They have non-Jewish outlooks. And a non-Jewish outlook is A, that results is, right, result is what matters. Success equals results. And therefore, the result is, I want to know Torah. That's the result. That's the goal. And that's all that matters, to know it. And therefore, give it to me, Rabbi, as fast as possible. Right, I'll give you an example. Medicine. What's the goal of medicine? To get better. Theoretically, if you could get better without taking the medicine, would you do it? 100%. And if you have to take the medicine and it's painful, okay, I'll, I'll swallow it as fast as I can because I want to get better. But there's no idea or advantage to going through the medicine, right? If a doctor came and said, listen, I could, you know, you go through physical therapy. Anyone here ever went through physical therapy, right? You get injured, you go through physical therapy. It's a process. You go once a week, twice a week, maybe, depending on how often they let you or how, or your insurance, whatever it is. And, um, and they give you a, a, pro it's a process. It's a six months, sometimes a year process till you could get back fully recovered. Right? And um, if a doctor came and said, listen, I could do 100% cure, chiropractor, and it's not a sketch. Okay, let's make believe it's not a sketch. It's not a joke. It's real, legitimate. And every, everyone agrees that it's a real. It's fully, fully going to heal you without any negative side effects. And I could do it in one treatment. Do you do it? 100%. Why, why, would, why would I wait, waste six months? If I could do it in one one minute, and and that's the outlook of everything when it comes to uh, the goyim. Everything is all about as fast as possible, get it done, get the results, fit quick, do it fast, yalla. So he goes and he says, Rabbi, convert me, one leg, as fast as possible. Give me the information. The faster, the better. Quick and easy. Shammai doesn't like that. Shammai is like, that's not Judaism. Judaism, it's not about getting better. It's not about the result. It's not about the knowledge. Judaism has im bechukotai telechu. There is an element of just studying. The journey itself is valuable in Judaism. It's not about the result. It's not about knowing. It's not about the information. If that was the information, then you download a chip in your brain, five seconds, and you know everything. And one day, by the way, they may have these. We will get one day. It will come. Make no mistake about it. There will be a day that we will be able to download a chip into our brains. You'll be able to buy a dictionary chip, put it in. You'll be able to buy a, a Safari a Torah chip, put it in. You'll be able to buy a chip, you download it, and we'll know everything in here in one second. It's very soon, actually. Very, very scary. A lot of interesting questions will come up halakhically as well when these, when these types of technological advances you know, arrive. But either way, Shammai says, but that's not the goal. The goal is not just to know. The goal is to learn. Learning itself is valuable. To study Torah, to learn Torah, even though you're not going to get any results later on. Forget about the knowledge. That's what Shammai tells this man. You're a goy. You're a non-Jew. You think like a secular person. That's fine. But if you want to become Jewish, you have to learn how to value the journey. The other goy, mistake number two, respect comes to those with high positions. Respect is given to those that are successful. So if I, want, I want to be a respected person. I want to become the highest status person. I want to become Kohen Gadol. 
But again, olam hafuch. It's not always about who looks on top with our amateur eyes. It's not about that. It's about who is really on top. Not status, but stature. You know, Pirkei Avot, there's a fascinating, fascinating Mishnah. I want you to open up. And, um, I mean, this is brilliant. Pirkei Avot, chapter 5, which is actually the chapter of the week. We are in the fifth week of the Omer. Hayom arba'im yom la Omer. Shehem chamisha shavuot vechamisha yamim. We're already in the middle of the sixth week, rather. But um, we study Pirkei Avot during the Omer. And there is a very beautiful Mishnah, if I could find it. Chapter 5. It's actually going to be all the way at the end. End of chapter 5. And here we go. As I keep stalling, and I will find the page. <laughs> okay. Still not here. Here it is. Last Mishnah of chapter 5, okay? I'm not sure what it's going to be in, in, the, in the book that you're using, but either way, last Mishnah. And we know each Mishnah, by the way, for those that are new to Pirkei Avot, Pirkei Avot is not a book of law, it's a book of ethics, right? Lessons for life, right? For those that have been studying it. Chapter 5, last Mishnah, Ben Bagbag Omer, says Ben Bagbag. Anyone ever heard of him? Ben Bag Bag Ben Bag Bag Omer Ben Bag Bag Ben Bag Bag Omer Omer Hafoch Ba Right? Ben Bag Bag says That's a nice name Okay, anyone have a third son that they are looking to name them after somebody free? Okay, Ben Bag Bag Well, anyways What does he have to teach us? Hafoch Ba Ba Hafoch Ba De Kol Ba Delve in it And delve in it For everything is in it Fascinating, beautiful idea. So that means we should delve and delve and delve. Study Torah. Everything's in Torah. Okay. Comes along another rabbi. Ben Hey Hey. Wow, what are these names over here today? Ben Hey Hey. Amar Le Bar Hey Hey. Amar Le Bar Hey. Right? These are all songs that Miami Boys Choir fans. Okay, either way. Or Yeshiva Boys Choir. I'm not sure which one. Either way, Ben Hey Hey. It's another rabbi's name, and he says a very famous line: "Lefum tsaara agra." I told you this before when I was working for my father one summer when I was a little kid, maybe 13, 14 years old. I was in the warehouse, and this, um, this uh, black man who was placing in orders, filling up his wagon with all these different types of electronic devices in my father's warehouse. And I was sweating and I was exhausted and I was tired. And all of a sudden, this black man says to me, Rabbi, don't you know? Oh, he didn't call me Rabbi. He says, Ariel, don't you know? Lefum tsaara agra. I'm like, what? What did you just say? Lefum tsaara agra. He quoted this line right here. The more pain, the more gain. Okay? And this is the... So the, the people who coined no pay, no gain, they got it probably from here. But either way, the reward is in proportion to the exertion. And our rabbi say something very fascinating. Who are these, who are these people? Ben Hey Hey, Ben Bag Bag. And our rabbi say they're actually, um, they are uh, nicknames to conceal their real identity. These people, Ben Bag Bag, Ben Hey Hey, they're actually converts. And the word bag, bet gimal, is gematria five, hey. And also, hey is gematria hey. Ben bag bag is hey, hey. We know that every convert is a child of Avraham and Sarah Imenu. Avraham and Sarah were known for their outreach, they converted a lot of people. And what letter was named and changed to Avraham's name? Originally his name was Abraham, Avram, and they added a hey. Sarah was Sarai. They changed it, they added a hey. So Avraham, Sarah, hey, hey. So Ben Hey Hey is the son and is a nickname for, it's a code word for Avraham, Sarah. 
Ben Bag Bag, same thing. I guess Hey Hey was taken, so he had to go with Bag Bag. Or uh, Da Da, you know, Dalit Aleph, Dalit Aleph, if you're Russian, maybe. You know, Ben Da Da. But either way, um, the, the, uh, the, these two people are converts, and they are, according to the Torah Temima, you ready? Not just any converts. They are the same converts that came to Shammai and Hillel. The first one that said, I want you to convert me on one leg. And what did Hillel teach him? He came, he converted, he learned Torah. And eventually he learned, it's not about the, it's not about the info. It's not about quick. It's not about one leg. You know what it's about? Study, learn, toil. To work hard to understand the piece of Gemara that's not going to ever be important in my life. That itself has value. So the same convert that thought like a secular person, he ends up learning his lesson and he comes to teach us in Pirkei Avot. Ben Heye, what does he teach us? Lefum tsara agra. It's not about becoming Kohen Gadol just because he looks important. He may be also important, but not necessarily just because with our eyes we respect the Kohen Gadol. But uh, at the end of the day, the reward isn't for the title. The reward isn't because you wear the breastplate or because you're called uh, CEO. That's not what Hashem cares about. He doesn't care about titles. Hashem cares about effort. Lefum tsaara agra. Unbelievable. Beautiful. And that is really what the Chafetz Chaim taught us. We know at every siyum maseche, we say the famous line, Anu amelim, behem amelim. We work hard, they work hard. We work hard and we get rewarded. They work hard and they don't get rewarded. And everyone that's listening to this is thinking, what are you talking about? They do get rewarded. Look how rich all these goyim are. They get rewarded. Says the Chafetz Chaim, they get rewarded for results. But if one day they come into work and they don't produce results, they get zero. We get rewarded for results. Anu amelim, shetihiu amelim batorah. We work hard and we get rewarded for that effort. Even if it breeds zero, zero success. And again, I hate using that word because success should not be measured in our terms. Success should be measured in the eyes with the terms of the Torah, with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So you need to ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen, when you're giving charity, not how much did I give? And if I gave the most in the synagogue, good for me. We need to ask ourselves, how hard was it for me to give? Am I extending myself to the max? Am I pushing myself to my limits? Because let me tell you something. If one person gives only a thousand dollars, but that's their limit, that's their 10%. And another person gives $10,000, but that's 1%. And they can be doing a hundred thousand more. Let me tell you something. What does Hashem value more? The first guy. Down here with our eyes, with our eyes down here, we give more kavod to the second guy. He's giving 10,000. We stand up for him. We give him aliyah, hazaku baruch, as we should, as we should, because it's, the guy deserves it. But in Hashem's eyes, if the guy who gave less is pushing himself to the max, olam hafuch, up there it's going to be upside down. When we're doing chesed, we need to ask ourselves, Am I giving the most of my time? Maybe I'm giving every day a half hour, but I could, I could be doing maybe a little bit more. And therefore, I maybe need to exert myself a little bit. I got to push myself. Effort. How much am I learning? Maybe I could push myself to learn a little bit more. Yes, I am learning a lot compared to other people in my friend group who are learning once a year. I'm learning once a day and it's great. But God's not going to ask me results. God's going to ask me effort. Am I really 
Is my brain really hurting after I finish learning? Am I really, you know, brainstorming and breaking my head on, on a piece of Gemara or Chumash or whatever? We'll learn? We gotta, we gotta, it's gotta, we gotta think about these things. It's, we gotta extend effort. We gotta exert ourselves. And if you will ask why, and we'll end with this. And if you may ask, Rabbi, why is effort so important all of a sudden? Why is it that results all of a sudden don't, don't matter as much as effort does? A very valid question. But Abotai, the answer is because anyone that's in a relationship for love knows that answer. If you're in a relationship for money, if you're in a relationship for business, if you're in a detached relationship, then of course, result is all that matters. But when it's about love, when it's about building a connection, there's only one way to build a connection, to invest, to invest time, to invest energy. The more time we invest in something, that's why you look around. Which people are most connected to a synagogue? The ones that give their blood, sweat, and tears. Whether through uh, volunteering for the time, doing different you know, functions for the synagogue, helping the synagogue financially, being part of the synagogue's uh, board, right? Whether you're a president or treasurer, it doesn't matter. But these are the people. And the more we do for the synagogue, the more we're going to feel connected. If our association to a synagogue is once a week, and we come in, and we hear the cantor, we hear the hazan, we hear a nice sermon and we give $52, $100, doesn't matter what the number is. We're not going to feel so connected to that synagogue. Just like a spouse. If your relationship with your spouse is you come in at night, hello, how was your day? Very good. We run and we hide ourselves in our office. We go and we hide behind the TV. We go and we bury ourselves in our phone. So our relationship with our spouse is going to be very superficial and there's going to be no content, there's going to be zero connection, zero connection. The way to build a connection with anybody is only with energy, with effort, with toil. The more I invest, effort that I have with my children as well is the same exact thing. It's not enough to just pay for their tuition. Well, come on, Rabbi. I'm paying $40,000. I don't love my son now, you're telling me? He better know I love him. For $40,000 uh, a year, he better know I love him. Yeah, but you know what? It's about effort. It's about spending time. It's about lefum ta'ara agra. The more we dedicate into any relationship, the more valuable that relationship is going to be. And we don't want just a result. Think about you ask your child for a cup of water. Is it about them getting it for us? Imagine your child gets you the cup of water, but they're huffing and puffing like the wolf and the three little pigs, and they're uh, humming, and they're all annoyed. I don't know, why'd you make me get you water? I always get you water. Who needs your water? I don't want your water if it's gonna be with that attitude, right? So to just do detached, is that what we want? It's what we want from our worker. It's what we want from our housekeeper. It's what we want from our maid or our gardener. We don't care. You love me, you don't love me. You come do my lawn. Come and clean my dishes. I pay you your, your, uh, your $15 an hour and go home. I'm not looking for a relationship here. But when the goal is a relationship, when the goal is to have a connection, that's only going to come about with how much energy we put. And therefore, our parasha begins, Im telechu. God says, don't just learn to do. That we should be zochet to value the learning itself. We should be zochet to value the journey itself. We should be zochet to value the exertion of energy and time and investment of ourselves, whatever we're doing for Hashem, for our children, for our spouses, for all the relationships and the people around us. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Bye-bye.